Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you've enjoyed the session so far. And as we come almost to the end of today, I'm going to be discussing with you complications of microlaryngeal surgery. Unlike most open neck surgery, microlaryngeal surgery is unique in that you are operating in a very narrow field with the operating site quite distant to you and your assistant really can't help you. You're dealing with microscopic disease, millimeters in diameter at, the at a time. And very often you're using your left hand as well, either to use the suction or retract the tissue or operate the laser micromanipulator. So you need to be ambidextrous. The suspension microlaryngeal system along with the microscope, the laser sometimes, or if you're using the video laryngoscopy system, the endoscope, camera, etc., everything becomes quite a lot of cumbersome equipment between you and the patient. And very often you're relying on your equipment of being of the highest quality to be able to give you good results. The complications of microlaryngeal surgery have been reported in literature ranging from 10% to 75%. Fortunately, majority of them are minor injuries to the tissue of the oral cavity and major complications are rare. However, the major complications can be extremely disastrous and sometimes can even lead to death on table and you need to act within a fraction of a second to manage these complications. So it's important to be aware of them. So I've kind of divided the complications into three categories, those related to anesthesia, those related to the equipment, and those related to the surgery as such. All microlaryngeal surgery is done under general anesthesia, of course. So any complication that pertains to general anesthesia will apply here. However, there are certain situations very unique to a microlaryngeal surgery, and it begins right at the first step of intubation because you might have a case of difficult intubation if you're dealing with a large tumor or extensive papillomas or a compromised airway case, and you need to have an anesthetist that knows how to deal with these situations, especially if you're using a laser that puts extra demands onto the anesthetist as regards the gas ventilation. And the suspension microlaryngoscopy system itself can cause sudden bradycardia or even stimulate tachycardia or increase blood pressure and alter the hemodynamics constantly. And post extubation laryngoscope, uh, laryngospasm is a complication that most anesthetists are quite scared of. Some surgeons like to operate with the apnea technique and that means that the patient will be prone to hypoxia, hypercarbia, arrhythmias and anesthetist needs to keep a close watch on all the vitals all the time. And those that are used to operate with the high flow jet ventilation or the venturi technique can have its own set of complications, for example, barotrauma, although quite rare. But all sorts of microlaryngeal surgery is obviously done with a small size, that is a size 5 or a 5.5 endotracheal tube. And that itself can cause hypoxia and hypercarbia because you're operating in a grown adult patient, many times obese patient, and it's quite a small tube for a large larynx. So how do you avoid these complications? Well, it always helps to have a very experienced team, especially in airway cases. Use laser safe tubes. Be ready to perform a tracheostomy. We are all ENT surgeons and trained in this. So there is no point in struggling with airway compromise. And be ready to operate in apnea if that demands and have your anesthetist be used to this. You and your anesthetist are both dealing with the same operating field. You're literally co-operating. So it is good to have a good rapport with your anesthetist and a team that is comfortable with all the scenarios and situations that one may encounter during a microlaryngeal surgery. Now coming to the equipment related complications, usually as I mentioned earlier, they are in the form of minor mechanical trauma to the oral cavity tissue. The lips, the tongue or the anterior pillow on the right side are usually the ones that are under risk of trauma because that is the side from which you will insert your scope. And trauma to the upper incisors, the site where your suspension system rests as a fulcrum is the area which is subjected to the maximum force and can uh, cause some amount of dental trauma, especially when there are loose teeth involved. Um, temporomandibular joint dislocation as such does not usually happen with suspension system, but if there is a pre-existing temporomandibular joint disorder that can get aggravated by this surgery. As you can see in the picture on the right, like a seemingly benign trauma to the lip, where the lip got caught between the teeth and the suspension for a, a few seconds. But in the post-operative period, it has turned into a troublesome ulcer. 
So you need to be careful of even the minor trauma. But this sort of a trauma where you have an entire bridge of dental implants which got fractured during surgery is the one that can be very distressing for the patient and the surgeon. Tongue paresthesia or lingual nerve injury forms a smaller number of all the complications associated with microlaryngeal surgery, but it can be really uncomfortable and distressing for the patient because the numbness and altered taste sensation may last up to a month or a month and a half sometimes. It is said to happen because of the stretching of the nerve or because of the pressure of the scope over the superficial fibers. The longer the surgery goes on, the more likely the patient becomes to develop this complication, especially if it has been a difficult exposure case where you have been struggling with inserting the laryngoscope and a lot of pressure is being uh, exerted. Female gender is said to be an independent risk factor, but many authors believe that that is because we do not tend to use different sets of scopes for male, uh, men and women. And many times the scope that you might be using might be a size too large for a female patient. So how do you avoid these complications? Wait for complete muscular relaxation. Make sure that the patient is in the deep planes of anesthesia before you start inserting the scope. Otherwise, you will unnecessarily be struggling against tissue. Insert the scope under vision with good illumination. Make sure you use your fingers to retract the cheek to avoid injury to the pillars, etc. And very often while you're inserting the scope, you're actually looking through it. So it's not possible for you to all the time keep an attention of what's happening around the scope. So have an assistant, keep an eye out so that the lips don't get trapped. There are certain situations, some dentition, some neck anatomy, etc., where you know that it is going to be a difficult case. So it's better to have these patients pre-warned um, and give them some idea that some complications can happen. For example, if you have patients with protruding teeth, missing teeth, implants, etc., you might want to warn them about possible dental injuries. And how can you avoid these? Well, choose the appropriate size scope for that patient. One size fits none, and it's good to have a variety of scopes ready with you. If it's a prolonged surgery, then it is a good idea to loosen or release the suspension system in between. And many surgeons like to use a compression bandage across the neck for anterior pressure, and it's a good idea to keep loosening that as well. Dental protectors for the upper alveolus, either the silicone or the metal variety, can seriously reduce the incidence of complications. Avoid having the chest piece resting directly on the chest and using a Mayo trolley or a table that goes across the patient's, uh, patient's body uh, to rest the chest piece on is a good idea. And then, like I mentioned, this bandage which many people like to use across the neck for anterior compression, you should have a thick cotton mop underneath it so that the pressure doesn't get transmitted to the neck as a compression uh, strangulation pressure. Now coming to the laser related complications, thermal damage, some amount of thermal damage does happen with every laser. Laser fire is the more dreaded complication that one needs to pay attention to. Like I mentioned, if you're using a laser, the laser tissue interaction itself will cause some amount of thermal damage to the non-target tissue because of the physics of conduction. And the lasers that we most commonly use in laryngology, for example, the CO2 laser or the KTP, that is the hemoangiolytic laser, have its own absorption length and the uh, CO2 is best absorbed by water, whereas the KTP is more better absorbed by oxyhemoglobin. However, the uh, depth of absorption of the CO2 is uh, favorable for its use in laryngology in that we can reduce the extent of thermal damage. And of course, you can avoid having thermal damage to its minimum by using the appropriate type of laser at its correct settings of wattage, and uh, the mode in which you are operating, etc. Of course, precise movements are absolutely a must. And it is a good idea to keep mopping the tissue with wet cotton oils and removing all the char or all the scabs as you go on operating to help tissue cooling and to have a clean field. Like I mentioned, you can have a customized knife or a customized laser spot blade or arc and tangential cutting can be achieved by giving constant tissue traction. The length and depth of the cutting spot or cutting blade can be adjusted to minimize thermal damage. When you use the super pulse mode or the ultra pulse mode and adjust the time on and time off, that is the heat dissipation index, you give the tissue adequate amount of time to cool down before the next laser shot hits it. And if you're using the subepithelial infiltration technique, that provides a good heat sink so that the heat is absorbed within the infiltrate and that can uh, limit the thermal damage. 
Laser fire is a relatively very rare but the most dreaded complication. It happens because of the laser beam hitting directly over the endotracheal tube, which is gas enriched. You can have sim a simple fire at the, around the cuff, which can then get uh, transformed into a blowtorch kind of a fire and can cause uh, disastrous burn injuries to the surrounding tissue. And you need to act in a matter of milliseconds. Immediately remove the tube, disconnect it from the anesthesia circuit, put it in a bucket of water and have somebody else attend to the patient in the meanwhile, secure the airway and do a damage control and damage assessment. But how do you avoid this? Well, of course, you would want to use a laser safe tube. Use all the laser safety protocol that is protective eyewear. Have all the exposed area of the patient's face covered with wet mops. Have a bucket of water ready in the OR in, for an emergency situation. Uh, whenever we are using a laser, we want the anesthetist to be ventilating with air or with FiO2 less than 30%. And always have a large patty in the subclotus, which protects the cuff from all sides so that you don't inadvertently hit over it. Uh, precise control movements are a must. And it is a good idea to have a suction in place for the plumes of the laser because, in fact, the laser plumes can even cause chemical pneumonitis. So these are a few of the laser protective glasses that we have. The colored ones, of course, are for the hemoangiolytic lasers. These are the laser safe tubes, which have a double cuff so that in case you uh, injure one cuff or burst it, the other cuff will prevent, um, uh, you can still carry on your surgery. We like to have uh, the cuff filled with methylene blue so that if inadvertently the cuff gets burst and the blue liquid seeping into your field will give you an idea to, that you have had a laser hit there. But ultimately, it's just a tool, so it's more important who is the person using the laser rather than what laser settings, etc. You, you have. So it's very important to be careful while using uh, the laser. Carbon granuloma is a sort of granulomatous lesion that can develop at the operative site, especially when there has been excessive tissue, uh, tissue uh, resection. And also when you have done concomitantly cauterization of the tissue. The reason that this is a disaster, that is a troublesome complication is because in the post-operative period, if you see a granuloma like that develop over your operated vocal fold, you don't know if this is a recurrence or a healing granuloma and it can be quite a difficult situation to address. So the way to avoid a carbon granuloma is make sure you have smooth edges at the end of your excision and clean up the operative site with mops to avoid any foreign particles at the site, at the wound site. I know Dr. Nerurkar likes to use this laryngeal wash. Basically, it's just irrigating the operated site with saline, of course, with a suction in the subglottis so that the liquid does not get aspirated, which gives you a clean operating wound at the operated wound at the end of surgery. Post-operatively, steroid nebulizations and management of reflux is also a good idea to prevent formation of such healing granulomas. Whenever you're using fine instru uh, powered instruments, it's important to understand that you cannot use them for fine cutting. They are basically meant for debulking. So you can avoid complications by using them only for select situations and make sure that the cutting edge is always under vision. Coming to procedure related complications, some amount of edema, slough, granuloma is expected with every surgery and that's more a part of the healing process than a complication. But scarring and webbing are the, uh, are the complications that are more distressing. So, for example, if you have a resection of this kind of a tumor, you are going to get slough at the operated site, which is not really a complication as such. But if the basic principles of wound healing uh, end up with the fibroblast proliferation becoming aberrant and you have abnormal extracellular matrix production and excessive collagenization, that forms a scar. Now, this alters the characteristics of your SLP, that is the superficial lamina propria, and the mucosal wave gets affected. If you have an excessive resection done, then there can be even be a phonatory gap. For example, this is a patient who had a small papilloma the previous histopathology of this had come out as a squamous cell carcinoma, so there was malignant transformation. So we went a little excess in our resection, which gave rise to quite a significant scar and a phonatory gap. How can you avoid these complications? Well, of course, always remember less is more. The less tissue handling and damage that happens, the more uh, clean your wound will be and better wound healing you will have. So avoid trauma to deeper structures. Use the correct laser settings. Work with the correct fluence of your machine. Depth, power, time on, time off, all can be adjusted to get a perfect fine cut with minimum charring and minimum thermal injury.
And of course, in the post-operative period, you should have voice rest and voice therapy and use all the principles of phono microsurgery, the microflap technique, etc., that Dr. Nirudkar has mentioned in her surgery to minimize complications. Webbing is the most difficult to manage complication. It can be an anterior or posterior web wherever you have two opposing raw areas. Now, this is a patient who had multiple surgeries done with cold steel for um, recurrent uh, papillomatosis. And this is, I think, 10 days after his last surgery when he had come to us. And now his problem really is the web rather than the papillomas. So how can you avoid these surgeries? There are a few factors you must follow intra-op and some points of note in the post-operative period. So in the intraoperative period, it is important to be judicious with your resection, resect only as much is required. And you can, if you can stage your resection, that is a good idea. For example, in these two pictures that you see, where there are bilateral leukoplakia patches or bilateral papillomas in a child, you may always decide to go up on operate the opposite side in a second sitting, in a planned manner, so you avoid having raw surfaces on both the vocal cords. In the post-operative period, if you know that this is a patient that did have extensive surgery bilaterally and is prone to develop a web, it is a good idea to schedule him for a post-operative slough cleaning procedure. So under general anesthesia, you just clean off all the exudate from both the vocal cords. Uh, usually we give voice rest to all our patients, but in case of there is a risk of formation of a web, you might not want to give this patient voice rest so that the vocal uh, folds are mobile and all the exudate keeps getting uh, thrown off and does not accumulate at the wound. Post-operatively, humidification and steroid nebulization is also a good idea as are prolonged uh, treatment with proton pump inhibitors. But there are certain specific situations in which you can get some complications. As uh, an example is injection laryngoplasty. Of course, the variety that we do endolaryngeally under anesthesia. So if you have bilateral injections being done, and since the patient is under general anesthesia, you may go overboard and can get airway compromise. But this is usually uh, not severe. And giving the patient steroids and oxygenation and just observing him for the few hours in a recovery, uh, recovery room will help him over this situation. The injection can go into the wrong plane. For example, if you're using a relatively stiff material like calcium hydroxyapatite and you end up injecting it into the superficial lamina propria for medialization, you will get a, a rigid tough scar or a granuloma rather than uh, getting medialization and you will lose the pliability of the uh, cover. Um, a Teflon granuloma, we since don't use Teflon anymore, so that's a complication of the past, so to say. When we are doing arytenoidectomies and resection of the arytenoids or Kashima's posterior chordotomy, especially when performed bilaterally, aspiration is a real potential complication. So managing to walk the fine line between a good airway and a safe swallow is what one needs to understand. When we have done extensive endolaryngeal endoscopic reception for malignancies and when you have gone right up to the thyroid perichondrium, then that exposed perichondrium cartilage uh, becomes prone to chondritis. So there are a few general principles that we need to follow when we are operating on the larynx. Always have good illumination and good quality equipment with good magnification so you can see the minutest detail of your operating site. Always have a variety of scopes available for you and use the one that is most appropriate. Use precise and sharp instruments, especially your scissors, your sickle knives, and make sure that your laser has got good alignment and perfect firing. Clean up the field at the end of resection. You don't want to have char or foreign particles over your operated site. Less is always more. Patient selection and counseling regarding potential complications, especially in airway cases or malignancies, etc., is very important. And you should always have a set post-operative protocol as regards antibiotics, hospital stay, voice rest, etc. It is better to give the patient an idea beforehand about the need of voice therapy and one cannot stress enough the importance of voice therapy in the post-operative period. And know your limits. The first surgery is the best chance a patient gets. So if there is some uh, particular situation that you feel you are not equipped to deal with, whether infrastructure wise or training wise, it is best to be upfront with the patient and try to work out a solution that works best for both. So no matter what you do to err is human, so you will have some oops moments off and on. The idea of this presentation is to make you aware how to deal with them so that your oops moments don't get repeated again and again. I thank you for your attention.